Chapter 10 Message in a Bottle The Bear Road The boy sat very still and stared blankly out to sea. His stomach felt as if it was tightly knotted inside him and his mouth felt very dry. He drank the last of the ginger beer. It was flat and warm and horrible and he wished he had a dozen more bottles just like it. Once on holiday at the seaside, he'd found a bottle on the beach with a message on a piece of paper inside it. It had come from another country, quite a long way away. His dad told him he had meant to look it up on a map when he got home, but he forgot. And now he couldn't even remember the name of the country. It hadn't said anything interesting, so far as he could tell but he had been excited to think how far it had come to reach him. He decided to write a message of his own. He used a paper bag the sweets had been in and wrote on it with a pencil from his bag. When he had finished, he put the paper into the bottle and screwed the top back on. Then he leaned out over the back of the boat and dropped the bottle into the water. He watched it, bobbing there on its side, growing smaller and smaller as they moved away from it. Soon it was just a speck in the distance, then it was half a speck, then it was gone. Chapter 11 Smelly Time passed. It got darker and a little colder, but otherwise nothing much had changed. The bear rode. The boy fidgeted and fussed. He was stiff and restless and despite his tiredness, longed for some activity. He wanted to stomp about impatiently, but there wasn't room. So all he could manage was some rather awkward shuffling and still unused to the unsteadiness of the boat. He lost his balance. He lurched against the side and the boat ticked, sending him further off balance. He arched his back, windmilled his arms and just managed to stay upright. Not only that, but he was pretty sure that the bear, head down and concentrating on his rowing, hadn't noticed anything. Then the boat rocked back the other way and the boy fell landing on the, his bottom with a loud thump. I've an alarm, Dan, said the bear, still not looking up. But the moon was full and bright enough for the boy to see him. <laughs> said the boy. The bear pulled his smile in at the sides a bit. You should get some sleep, he said. It's late. Not tired, said the boy, sitting tenderly at his seat. Then he yawned noisily. <sighs> no, I can see that. Are you hungry, though? Do you want something to eat? I think we'd better save the chocolate for now. But there's a sandwich left. The bear stopped rowing and reached beneath him for his lunch box. I thought we'd eaten them all already, said the boy. I thought so too, said the bear. But then I cleared out all the tin foil and found this one at the bottom of the box. I think it must have been left over from my last trip. So it's uh, a bit past its best. What's in it, said the boy. He tried a few of the bear sandwiches in he tried a few of the bear's sandwiches which had a knack of being eccentric. There had been tuna fish, peanut butter and pineapple, sprout and honey, chili pepper, mustard and horseradish, and what the bear called his breakfast special. Bacon, sausage, egg, porridge, cornflakes and coffee beans between two slices of bread. 
He didn't relish the thought of anything else along the same lines, but he really was very hungry. The bear rummaged in the lunchbox and pulled out something bready and triangular. He held it towards the boys. Or oh, yours, he said. The boy looked at the proffered sandwich. He noticed that the bear was holding it rather gingerly at the tips of his two claws and right at the corner. Despite this, the bread did not bend at all. The boy looked up at the bear. He looked back down at the sandwich. It was very difficult to tell what colour it was by the moonlight, but whatever colour it was, it didn't seem right. What's in it? said the boy. I can't remember, said the bear. We'll open it and take a look, said the boy. I can't, said the bear. It's stuck. The boy looked up at the bear. The bear smiled. Finley down at the boy. They both looked at the sandwich. Is it? said the boy. Wah, wow, said the bear. Is it only a bit? Is it glowing? No, said the bear. They each squinted at the sandwich and leaned in cautiously to look more closely. Hardly at all, said the bear. I'm not really that hungry, said the boy. You have it. That's very kind, said the bear. But I think I'll save it for breakfast. When he put the sandwich away, again, the boy noted that the bear locked the lunchbox, which he didn't usually do, and seemed to take extra care as he stowed it away. There they are looking at the sandwich. They each returned to their usual places. You should get some sleep, said the bear. I'll keep going for a bit. It's nice now. Thought I'll roll for a little while and take a look at the moon. Look at the moon, said the boy. Why? It's not going to do anything, is it? I mean, the moon's just the moon. But as he said it, he looked up at the moon himself. And there was nothing better to do. He kept looking at it for a while. He'd been right. It didn't do anything, but it didn't have to. It was just beautiful. It was just... It just was. The boy gazed at the moon be longer and harder than he had ever done before. Because who would spend time looking at the moon when there was telly to watch and video games to play and comics to read and felt for a moment calm and safe and sure. Coo, he said, but very quietly. And then the boy looked at the stars. There were a lot of them, more, he thought, than usual. He wondered where all the new ones had come from. Maybe they were all just the usual ones, but they all bunched together in the same bit of sky. He twisted his neck, looking up at different patches of the sky, but they all seem equally crowded. You can see more stars out here, said the bear, as if reading the boy's mind, because it's properly dark. The boy lowered his head and looked at the bear. It's funny, isn't it? said the bear went on. With everything else you can't see as well as in the dark. But with stars, you can see them better. In towns with street lights and such like, it's not dark enough to see some of them. But out here, he looked up and smiled. And either forgot to continue or felt no need. The boy looked up again. They sat there for a while, quiet and content, 
drinking in the beauty of the bejeweled night. Do you use them to navigate by? asked the boy. Eh? The boy looked at the bear and his neck stiffened by a light breeze gave a small ache of complaint at having to move again. Do you use the stars to know which way to go? The boy scrunched his up brow. To know which way is north and south and everything. Ooh, said the bear, that sounds clever. How do you do that? I don't know, said the boy. You're supposed to be the sailor. I don't even know the names of any of them. They have names, said the bear. The boy's wide eyes were like two small dim stars now, staring hard in disbelief. Yes, of course, said the boy. They all have names. And if you know the names, you know which one is which and where they go, then you can tell which direction is which and know which way you need to go. Somehow. Cue, said the bear. That sounds like a lot of hard work when you just could just use a compass. Have you got a compass? said the boy. No, said the bear. So how do you know which way we're going? I just do, said the bear. I know where we are and I know where we're going. And that's all. And that's enough. The boy looked grumpy and suspicious. He was getting cold too. He hunted around, huffily, feeling for his coat in the especially dark darkness beneath his seat. Oh, said the bear, I do know one thing about telling directions from the stars. What's that then? said the boy. The bear pulled his oars in and stood up, raising in his eyes to the deep dark and then the dazzle of the sky. He scanned the stars and the patch of sky directly above, as if he was seeking something out. The boy stood too, up on top of the middle bench seat, closer to the bear than he normally ever got to follow his gaze. He was still shorter than the bear, but he could look into his eyes now and see reflected in their dark wetness the wonder and magic and mystery of the night. The stars sparkling and sparkling within. Then he looked up again, trying to see what the bear saw, searching the blinking lights as if for clues or patterns. You see, said the bear in a distant, quiet voice, as if almost in a trance. He slowly raised an arm. You see, he pointed at the name of the stars above. Those three brightest stars there, almost in line. Yes, said the boy in a whisper, looking straight along the bear's raised arm and pointed claw. Well, that way, said the bear. Yes, said the boy. That way, said the bear. Yes is definitely yes up said the bear there was a long long pause during which the boy considered a number of things to say to the bear he came up with something quite good and very rude but was still waiting for the bear to stop sniggering naughtily at his own joke when he was overcome by a horrible feeling of nausea the bear, still giggling, had not lowered his arm and the boy's face was close to his armpit. Ugh, you stink! It wasn't as clever a thing to say as he intended, but it worked really well. The bear looked hurt and the boy was glad of it. I've been working quite hard, you know, said the bear defensively, quickly lowering his arm. I'm bound to wake up as bit of a sweat. I'm surprised if I would smell a little ripe. Ripe, said the boy, pinching at his nose and retreating to the back of the boat. 
More like rotten. I think I'm going to be sick. Ugh. The boy leaned out of the boat and overacting outrageously pretended to be sick. Yeah. Ooh, uh, it's a whiz, matey. I'm stuck on a boat with a fat, stinky bear. Bleh, send help. Send the Coast Guard. Send soap. His already unconvincing gapt was made no more believable by frequent bouts of laughter. Even without looking back, the boy could tell that the boy was bear was hurt, and he no longer took pleasure in the fact. But somehow, now that he had started laughing, he found that he couldn't stop. He slumped over the side and laughed and howled and beat his fists until he was breathless and hoarse and exhausted. At last he stopped. He felt ashamed and didn't want to look around at the bear. But somehow, even now, he felt the ur no urge to apologise. So he knelt there, staring into the dark water, staring to his brief listening to his breathing and his heart both slowing. Suddenly the water lit up and the boy saw his reflection. There were tears on his cheeks and he didn't know if they were tears of laughter or of regret. Either way, he didn't want to look at himself. So finally he stood embarrassed, still not facing the bear directly but glancing sheepishly at the corner of his eye. The bear had lit an old-fashioned lantern and was hanging it from a pole he had raised at the front of the boat. The bear sat down and took up his oars once more. You should sleep now, he said. The boy turned away from him, lay down and curled himself up beneath the ragged blanket that the bear had given him the first night. He closed his eyes and listened to the rhythm of the oars. Splish, splish, splish. He wondered what he might say or do to apologise. But before he had thought of anything, he had fallen asleep.